Hey Connect family, uh, PD here. I want to welcome you to Connect Church. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the lead pastor here and I'm so, so grateful that you're with us today. Whether you're watching online at our online platform or you're watching on Facebook Live, maybe a watch party, good job if you're doing that. Wherever you are, thanks for being here. I'm so grateful. Listen, we've been in this series. It's called uh, Encounters with Christ. It's been uh, really, really meaningful and powerful to a lot of people. And we talked with um, a lot of people about it, and the feedback's just been great. And so I really want to encourage you to go listen to the series on our YouTube channel. Check it out. But before I get into the series, I want to mention a few important things, or really a couple important things. And that is, um, if you have not had a chance to sign up for our water baptism, our water baptism is next week. So next Sunday, I'll be preaching in the morning on water baptism. And then Sunday night, we will have a water baptism service at our 280 location. Actually, right under me is a pool. And so let's just pray that I don't sink, you know, and drop into that. But if I do, uh, it's heated, praise the Lord. But anyway, we have a water baptism, so I don't want you to miss that. So I hope that you can take that next step in your journey. Speaking of next steps, I want to encourage you, if you are looking to be a part of a spiritual family, I want to encourage you to be a part of our next steps. Come on, take that next step. Become a part of a spiritual family. It'll literally change your life. Now listen, let's get into our series today. This is the fourth installment. We've had three in incredible, extraordinary conversations that for the people in the Bible, they were never the same again. And for those of us who are listening and letting the Word of God get in us, we've, we're never the same again either. In fact, I've actually had people uh, write me and message me just saying, you know, last week's message totally changed my life. And and the one before Easter, and whether I'm a 50 or I'm a 500, totally changed my life. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And so I just want to say praise the Lord. Thank you for your, your comments and your encouragement. More importantly, I'm just so thankful to God that his word is so life-changing. And I'm praying that will be the case uh, for you today. Today's topic, uh, we're going to talk about Jesus, Cleo, and his companion. Cleo, what do you mean? Well, it's actually, his name was Cleopas. But I just can't use that. It's just, you know, I'm sure he was called Cleo. It makes me, it reminds me of Theo. Remember Theo from the Huxable family, the Cosby show? And so I just think Cleo fits better. So I'm just going to say that even though in the Bible it says Cleopas. Cleopas. Okay. So we're going to we're gonna talk about a conversation that Jesus had with these two guys. Before I get into it, though, just to kind of open things up, have you ever, you, you're out and about, and you see someone a little bit off in the distance, and you look at them, and you're like, gosh, I know that person. I know that I know that person, but I cannot seem to pull or recall, peg their name, right? Anybody out there in the chat, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. You see someone, you know someone, but you just can't recall their name. And then what happens? You're trying to remember their name, and then they start walking towards you. They start coming towards you, and they're like, hey, hey. Yo, Derek, you know, and, and all of a sudden this, this girl comes closer. She's like, Derek, Derek, hey, how you doing? How's the kids? How's Stacy? You know, or maybe it's a guy at the gym and he comes over. He's like, what's up, man? How you doing? Derek, what's, 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 what's new with you? And I'm like, hey, buckaroo. Like, you don't know what to say. You, you know you should know the person's name, but you just can't come up with it. And so this story is a little bit like that on steroids, okay? And so today we're going to see a close encounter Christ had with Cleo and his companion, and they're on this road to Emmaus. It's a famous story, the seven-mile journey, and it kind of symbolizes our path, our journey a little bit, and I hope to unravel that for you kind of as we go forward. It's perfect because it's a post-Easter experience. This actual story from our key text, Luke chapter 24, is actually right after Easter. We just had Easter last week, so it kind of fits perfectly. And it's a celebration, not so much of the resurrected Lord, it's more a recognition of the resurrected Lord. And so remember that word, recognize, okay? Now, in addition to today's service, we're going to have communion in the middle of the service, okay? Or at the end of the service today. But first, let's set the scene. And this is taken from Luke chapter 24, I'm going to go a little bit back to the Easter moments, right before, it's after Jesus died, and, 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 he, and now he's, he's risen. And it says in Luke 24, this is roughly, you know, one, verses 1 through 12, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, 
they, um, they're going to um, anoint Jesus' body with spices. They go to the tomb, and when they get there, they meet two angels. First of all, they see the tomb's empty. They're freaking out. They see two angels there, and they're like, what are you looking for? Why are you looking for, you know, um, the, the, the living among the dead? Uh, and didn't he tell you this was going to happen? And they're like, oh, my gosh, yes, he did. He's alive. They go back to the disciples. They leave their run in their book. And they go back to the disciples, and all the disciples are like, whoa, 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 ladies. Uh, this is nonsense. I don't know about this. Peter runs to the tomb. He sees the tomb's empty, and he's totally crazy perplexed. He doesn't know what's going on. And sort of the point of this up to this point, the point of this up to this point, is that Christ has risen from the dead, and he's Lord, and he's done what he said he was going to do. And, um, and, and you, you and I, they had to, but you and I both have to as well, believe for ourselves that this is true. In other words, you got to believe in the resurrected Christ. If we want in our life, listen, resurrection power, we have to believe in a resurrected Christ. If you need the ability, the power from God to be able to overcome, like Jesus did, death, hell, and the grave, this earth and all its temptations and all its allurements and all its problems, we need that kind of power, that kind of resurrection power. We're going to have to first decide we believe in a resurrected Lord. Amen? Now, in verse 13 and 14, continuing, it says, after that happened, it says, that same day, the same day the two ladies go to the tomb see it empty, the same day two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus. They're on this seven-mile journey to Jerusalem, and they're talking to each other about every, everything that had happened. What are they talking about? They're talking about uh, basically the Good Friday, good for us, bad for Jesus, uh, where Jesus has been crucified on the cross. That's what they're talking about on their journey. And they also probably are familiar with this rumor um, that some women went and to an empty tomb. It's all that is buzzing through the community. And this story that we're going to unpack highlights um, the lost hope that people had when Jesus died. And Paul actually wrote in the book of Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 19, he said, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, speaking of his death, we are of all men most miserable. What is he saying? He's saying, if you just believe in what happened on the cross, you're not going to be very happy. But now, is Christ risen from the dead? So he's basically saying the thing that lifts us up, that pulls us out of hopelessness, is the acknowledgement and the awareness that Christ is risen. But on that first day, these two disciples and many others had um, the absence of that living hope. They were, it was far from their reality at this time. And, and Cleo and his companion have not experienced that for themselves. And so lessons that I want to give you, I want to give you three of them. But the first lesson on the road to Emmaus, which again symbolizes a journey, but the first lesson on the road to Emmaus is it was first a heartbreaking experience. Write that down if you're taking notes. It was first a heartbreaking experience. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but a lot of the saddest words in the English language, they begin with the letter D, like disappointment, discouragement, despair, defeat, delusion, um, disaster, um, and of course, death. And of course, my name begins with D too. That really makes it bad. <laughs> um, but all of these words are kind of the mood that we find Cleo and his companion in, and then this stranger appears along the road with them. They've left um, dispirited, and they're on their way as a band of disciples um, processing this uh, Good Friday experience and the fresh memories of that. And I think there are many people listening to me now and will listen in the future and maybe never listen that could sympathize with this, I don't know, bewilderment. They were so confused by what was happening because their master at this point as disciples, the person that they loved, they cared about, they followed, was horribly murdered. Um, the, of the most degrading kind, he was 
um, the crucifixion was a public spectacle where they would, would they, of course, not really hurt you, but they would, they would shame you and they would expose you and they would jeer you and insult you. And what's interesting, not interesting, but what's amazing is that only a week before, Palm Sunday, he was coming into the city of David and they were singing Hosanna, Hosanna, and they were shouting and they were, they were, um, they were just so excited uh, and they were so for him and the, and the disciples uh, were jacked and their, hope had, their hopes at that point had risen probably to an all-time high, a fever pitch because they believed at that time that their Messiah was going to be a king and he was going to uh, uh, save them from the tyranny of the Roman Empire and then he dies and their hopes were dashed and their dreams were smashed all bam in a moment and so the band of followers of Jesus were disassembled they were without a leader uh, they were falling apart they were disoriented and confused and these two guys are, are two of those people and they're on their way home. And this idea that Jesus had maybe come out of a tomb, ah, it just confused them. They weren't buying it. In fact, the scripture says, they said, in verse, uh, I forget what verse it is, but Luke 24, it says, we had hoped that he was the one. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Isn't it interesting, and I think this is a note that you have if you're taking notes, that human hope is a fragile, fragile thing. Human hope is a really fragile thing. It, it, can it can wither and die in difficult times. It's very hard to reboot, refresh, revive, because what, what, the, what does the Bible say? It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And hopelessness is such a, it's a disease of the human condition. Very, very hard to cure. And it's like when you see someone that you love and they, and they just don't get better. And they slowly begin to die and you can't see that turning around somehow in some way you can't see a recovery you can't see a, a, a return to the normal and so you because of those things are afraid to hope you don't want to bank on hope believe hope and and as a result because you don't want to experience a letdown so you don't go down that road and so many people live in a hopeless resignation Many of you may be doing that with your marriage. Many, may, many of you may be doing that with the dream that you had when you were a young person. Many, many of you may be doing that as you're looking at your business. I know someone that uh, indirectly, but who, who, who took their own life recently because they lost hope. And Cleo and his companion, I think they've erected a, a wall of hopelessness around them. And they were trapped, in a sense, in their misery. We had hope, they said. In other words, we don't expect it now. We, we used to expect it, but we used to have this thing called hope, but we don't have that now. So I wonder if there's anyone out there that identifies with this. I know there's been different times in my life where this has definitely been the case, and sometimes I find myself dipping in and out of those moments. And so I think this will help you. And so if you're listening to this story, this Emmaus story, um, I hope you can... Understand that God wants to take you out of this heartbreaking experience, and he wants to move you to a new level. We'll talk about that in a second. But here's back to the story. It says, while they were discussing these things, in this state of hopelessness, it says Jesus himself, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them in verse 15. I love this. I love that, and I think this is universal, it's unilateral. It, 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 it's, it's, uh, it doesn't have any, it's not just for some people, it's for all people. But I love that when we are struggling and trying to make sense out of our lives, when we're trying to um, unravel the knots, Jesus is walking there right beside us. And when our expectations are not being met, Jesus is right there, right beside us. Isaiah 57, 15 says, I love this verse, it says, I live, speaking of God, in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So you can see there is a condition, a, a lowly condition, a broken, a contrite spirit that is attractive to a God is here and it brings him right down here. God may live there in heaven, but God wants to come down here with you and come alongside you, ordinary people like you and me, according to his word. And so it's ironic that as we unpack this story, we recognize Jesus. 
We see him as the risen Lord. But somehow, for some reason, they didn't recognize Jesus. Perhaps it's their hopelessness. Perhaps it's something more. The Bible actually says, this is weird. It's interesting at the very least. They were kept from recognizing him. They were kept. In other words, it's maybe not an accident. It's maybe intentional. It's as if they were not allowed to see Jesus. And I submit to you that that fact is there for us, that something happened there 2,000 years ago that was meant to help us today. The things that are in the Word of God, when you read your Bible, it's, they were meant for your um, instruction. They were meant for your benefit. They are there as examples that have ti they're timeless truths that have benefits for all time in all situations. And so they're thinking, did, did, it, did it really happen? Did, did, he, did he die? Did he come back to life? Is it true? How, if, it, if it is, how could it have happened? And in and, and verse 17, the stranger, notice it's not Jesus. The stranger asked them, hey, what are you guys talking about as you walk along? And for some reason, he's got, this is sacrilegious what I'm about to say, but it, it's like he's like a bartender. It's like there's something about him and they want to tell him everything. There's something about a person, certain personalities, and you just, you just want to unpack. So they begin to tell him their sad story. Please don't quote me on that, okay? All right. But he, they tell him everything. And, it, and better than a bartender and better than a, um, a counselor or a therapist, he was incredibly kind and compassionate this time. If you think about what they're saying and what they're even, their convictions were, um, he doesn't berate them. He doesn't scold them. He doesn't quote the Bible Unless a seed dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I mean, he could have said, I told you this. What's the matter with you guys? Get over here and smack him right now. He didn't do that. Um, in verse 16, continuing though, it says, but they were kept from recognizing him. God was not allowing them to see him. Why would God deliberately keep himself or not re keep them in the dark in a sense? Doesn't the Bible say somewhere in 1 Timothy where it says that he wishes that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of the truth. Doesn't he want everyone to see? Of course he does. Yes, he does. But then what's this about? Well, I think it's something more. I think that it's, it's, there's a bigger meaning to this whole thing. And so check this out. I think Jesus knew he had to leave so that he could reach the world. For God so loved, John 3, 16, the world. So God didn't come just to love a few people, but as a human being, a man in physical form, how could he physically be there for everyone? He was going to have to establish something, not only by the Holy Spirit, where he could be with everyone, come alongside one, people and help people. I'd love to talk about the Holy Spirit, but that's not for today. But he wanted to reveal his true identity, listen, by the preaching and teaching of his word, and the breaking of bread and communion with believers. This is huge. So in verse 25 through 27, somewhere around there, what does Jesus do? He breaks open first the word to them. Listen, I'm going somewhere with this. He breaks open the word to them, the word of God, the bread of life. And then later in uh, verse 28 to 32, he literally breaks bread with them in fellowship and communion. So. Listen, my, listen, friends, God doesn't want you to have a religious experience. He doesn't even want you to have an emotional experience. He's, he's all for experience. Don't get me wrong, but it's not enough. God wants you to be rooted in a proper understanding from his word in who he is and have revelation knowledge of who he is by the understanding of his word through communion with him. The breaking of bread. And so, in his divine providence, he decides to keep some of this reality of who he is from these two disciples, from even recognizing him, until, 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 until they were ready to receive the bread of life and the bread of fellowship. We'll call it that. And so he's trying to say, in my own way and in my own time, I will reveal the glory of who I am to the people that I love. Continuing in the story in verse 17 and 18, isn't this cool? So um, I hope you're enjoying this. Write that in the chat because I'm going to look for affirmation. <laughs> but it says this, they stood still. 
They're still in this despondent state. Their faces downcast. One of them named Cleo, Cleopas, I'm going to just say Cleo, asked him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem that does not know uh, what's happened in the last few days? Another, where have you been? Everybody's talking about this stranger. You mean to tell us you've been here all this time and you don't know what's going on? Jesus plays along. He says, what things? Tell me what things you're talking about. And so, verse 19, they say, oh, about Jesus of Nazareth. Listen to how they describe Jesus. They say, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests handed him over to be crucified. We had hoped that he was the one, one who was going to redeem Israel. Everything they're saying is in the past tense. He was a prophet. He, he was, we hoped he was the one. And so what brought their disappointment, what, what brought upon them their incredible discouragement and hopelessness uh, was what they expected him to do. See, most of our disappointment comes from our expectations being aligned um, with our will, not with God's will. Most of our disappointments come from our expectations being aligned with our will versus the will of God. So as a result, their faith and many, many other people's faith it died on the cross when Jesus died. And so because they could not see him accomplish what they thought the, he was supposed to accomplish, and, there, and, and then he's there crucified, it's over. And for some reason, in, in, different, in, in the same way, I should say, in different situations, you probably have had the same kinds of feelings about parts of your life, stories in your life, scenes in your life and you were expecting God to come through the way you thought he should come through. You designed a plan for how God should. Have you ever prayed or have you ever told God, God, this is how I think you should do it. If I were you, this is how I would do it. And we, in a sense, impose our will upon his will. But God doesn't play like that. And, and so as we're walking down this path of life, when we do that, we come to places of disappointment and discouragement as a byproduct. But, and, and then sometimes we even question if God is God because of that. That's how bad that propensity is. It can lead us to literally total um, death of our relationship with God. We don't even believe he's real. Many people have fallen prey to that. We have whole new terms to describe the deconstruction of people's faith. And a lot of it has to do with what I just said. So God doesn't, he's not up there trying to give you what you want. He, but it doesn't mean because he doesn't give you what he wants that he doesn't care. In fact, his plan for you might be better. And I submit to you it's way better than what you had planned or what, how you thought it was going to be. Actually, it's probably, it's it, like Ephesians 3.20 says, he wants to do exceedingly abundant beyond all that you could even ask or imagine. If the word is true, and I believe it is, that's the kind of God who loves you and wants something for you. But he won't start with what you want. He'll start with what you, with what you need. So the people collectively at this time, you can apply it to yourself as an individual, but collectively they were looking for someone to set them free from the slavery of the Roman Empire. But God was sending his son into the world to set them free from the slavery of sin. They wanted a Messiah on earth who would be with them just for a little while. But God was sending a Messiah who would be with them all through the ages and for eternity. See, God always has a better plan for you than you could design for yourself. Can I have an amen out there? So instead of... Uh, 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 trying to tell him how to do it. Submit to what he has for you. Then in verse 25 through 27, here's where it gets, it's starting to get interest, even more interesting. Jesus is saying this. He's saying, if you guys would pay attention to the Old Testament, if you, you wouldn't have lost faith, he says, in me. He starts to introduce some personal language. He says, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer the things that happened and then enter his glory? And then it says, he goes back. So beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus takes all these, these two disciples, Cleo and his companion, on a major Bible tour. 
And I think he, who knows, he could have started in Leviticus and he shows them how these sacrifices were incomplete and there was going to be an ultimate sacrifice, a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. Maybe he took them to the Psalms, which is loaded with biblical prophecy. One of them in uh, Psalms 22, 16 says, a band of evil men has encircled me and they have pierced my hands and my feet. Or maybe he took them to one of the most famous prophecies in all the Bible, Isaiah 53, 5, which says that the servant of the Lord was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed or bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds or by his stripes. Come on, somebody. We are healed. I'm convinced that he had to go to Psalm uh, 1610, which says, You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let the Holy One see decay. See, I think he brought them back to these places, these junctures along the way in the Bible. And he just started making things pop. He starts to crack the code of the Old Testament. And that which was concealed is being revealed as he explains it to them right here, right now in the Word. So the point is this. If you're going to have an encounter with Christ, what he's trying to teach us is you're going to have to have an encounter with the Word of God, with the words of Christ. And so this is where the, ex the experience, uh, the ability to receive the power of God, you have to embrace and accept and understand the Word of God. Amen? So God always blesses me when I read the Word of God. Sometimes I don't feel like it all the time, but there's never been a time when I read the Word that I don't feel blessed because of the Word. In fact, when I don't read the Word, I feel farther from God. But with these guys, they're in an incredible experience with Jesus. I think these two guys on the road to Emmaus are, are just absolutely jacked because for the last, who knows, few hours, they've been listening to the greatest explanation of the Holy Scriptures from way back in the Old Testament to the present. They're totally pumped, totally excited, and they're basically saying, hey, listen, don't leave, don't go anywhere, we want more, uh, you've been feeding us with the Word of God, now will you let us feed you? Can you come over to our house and can you have a meal with us? What an interesting combination. He's breaking open the word of God and they're asking him, can we break bread together? There's something supernatural that happens when you join those two things together. The, in a sense, the supernatural with the natural. So in verse 28, <clears throat> it says this. As they approached the village to where they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going to keep on going. Interesting. But they urged him strongly, oh, no, 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 no. Stay with us. Stay with us. For it is nearly evening. The day's almost over. So he did. He went to stay with them. And here's where the big moment comes. Here's where there's this intersection of these two ideas, the bread of life and the bread of fellowship. Verse 30 through 32. When he was at the table with them, he took some bread like this, right? And then he broke it and he began to give it to them. And the Bible says when he broke it and gave it to them, look what it says. It says then, everybody say then. It was then and only then that their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is not saying that their eyes were closed before that. This is talking about their spiritual eyes. This was like they had an oh, they had an aha moment. They had a I, I get it moment, and they recognize this is Jesus. This is the resurrected Lord, and check this out. And then he disappears. Oh, wow. He's just, he's out of there. He's sitting at the table, and then bam. It was as if I, it's just, I left the camera. I left the scene, okay? Maybe when this happened, they began to remember like what it was like when he broke bread and he fed the 5,000. Maybe they began to remember what they heard that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup and he took the bread and he began to break it and have fellowship uh, with his disciples and said, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. They recognized Christ is not dead when they broke, when he broke the bread. And they're about to praise God and he, poof, disappears. Why? Why would he disappear? What's going on? I'm not 100% sure on this, but I'm, I'm submitting to this as your pastor, and I know there are other people that would, would agree to this, but I think God was trying to teach us something. I think that 
God, the, through the inspiration of Scripture to us now, that Christ was trying to teach us to put trust in the Scripture and in the, the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, and in the sacrament of communion. That that, that would be more important, listen, than seeing him in the flesh in the here and now. Not ultimately, but in the here and now. One day, we'll see him not through a glass darkly, but we will see him face to face according to Corinthians. But for now, the closest we can get to Christ, save the Holy Spirit, is through the Holy Scriptures, revelation of his word, living bread, and breaking bread with one another in communion. And so it's more important in a sense to see Christ with, your, with the eyes of faith than with the eyes in your head. This is so good. I hope you guys are saying amen. I hope there's high fives and all those crazy emojis are going on because this, this is powerful stuff. So no wonder they said, no wonder our hearts, later on it says, no wonder our hearts were burning within us. We were, because they're like, we were just having communion with Jesus, the Son of God. Do you know someday, you're going to be in heaven at the, we're going to, we go from the supper today, right now, we're going to have a supper, but one day we're going to, the, the, one of the first meals we're going to have is the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that day we will see him face to face, glory to God. But the way that Jesus dealt with this situation, I think is a lesson to us all that it helps people who are in a position of hopelessness, people who have lost hope. So many want Jesus to be near them, and so many want him to kind of have this tangibility. Well, it's through his word, and it's through communion you can. You can find hope again. And so this heartbreaking experience changes to a heart-filling experience. That's our second lesson, is a heart-filling experience, because life has distractions, and it's filled with hard work and routine and the grind and and sometimes we get so mechanical and sometimes on our on this dusty road we call earth this road we travel called earth this journey this temporary assignment that we're in we sometimes we sometimes lose that heart filling experience and because of this we can we cannot sometimes we don't experience the glory and strength of his presence that wants to be with us and so life can lose meaning. We can know him uh, and have a certain uh, confidence in eternal security in, from, from earth to heaven. But, but here now, we're losing hope because we've got issues and problems and we feel that disconnect. And so Jesus is still there, by the way, when we don't see him. That's what this story is telling us. In a sense, he's a cloaked Christ to some uh, and, and, and he's walking beside us. He's listening to us. And if we're willing to hear, and if, if we're willing to kind of um, tune into him, he wants to, to his word, he wants to reveal himself to us. And so the two disciples spoke of the cross, and, 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 it, was, and it was making them sorrowful, and they were having this heart-breaking uh, experience, but God wants to fill them. And so how does he do that? He pointed to the revelation of God from the word. I have to go back to that again. And so from the beginning, Moses to the prophets, Jesus explains to them the Holy Scriptures. And he, it's amazing. He starts with the Old Testament. What? Like nobody thinks that way. But Jesus did. We underestimate, first of all, the power of God. And we underestimate the power of the word of God. And we even more underestimate sometimes the Old Testament. So I think Jesus on this road, he was unpacking things for them. In, the, in seminary, we have this, these terms called types and, and, and symbols and shadows. The Old Testament has certain things concealed that the New Testament reveals. Old Testament concealed, New Testament revealed. Old Testament contained, New Testament explained. So Jesus is, is this New Test, the embodiment of the New Testament is unraveling all these things for them. And so he, he makes visible to them what Abraham did when he, when he went to sacrifice his son, his one and only son, and God gave him back to him. He, he reveals these types and shadows. He, he reveals through Israel's deliverance, their exodus from Egypt, the type of world, and how the angel of death passed over, and now 
Jesus is the Passover lamb. He reveals to them when there was that plague and the serpents that when Moses picked up the serpent on, on that staff in, in the form of a cross and if everybody would look to it, they would be saved or they would be healed. And the same is true today that if we put our faith in the cross of Jesus Christ, we all can be saved for eternally. And now Jesus stands there and he states these things as the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies and, he, and, and they don't see it. They don't see it right away. Stuff's happening inside. And the reason sometimes we don't see things right away is because I think we read the word of God selectively through our own will and not through God's will. In fact, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us receive the word as it was intended, not as we want as, to, to match our intent or our intentions. And so there were many passages that they read or they would skip over because they didn't fit the narrative that they had for Jesus. And so when they had been given this full exposition of the scriptures, they suddenly want more. And that's where we get, the, and their hearts become filled with the word. And they have this incredible experience. And that leads us to our third lesson on the road to Emmaus. And that was, it was a heart-burning experience. A heart-burning experience. This is about the presence of God. See, something happens when we take in the word of God, and we have uh, the bread of life, and then we break bread, and we pray. Something supernatural happens. It happened in the Last Supper. It happened in this experience. You will come to a recognition, a place, an acknowledgement that the very presence of Jesus is there. And so this, this journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus, for them, because their hearts were burning, it seemed like five minutes. And the Bible says, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acts as if he's going to go away. Why? Because he's a gentleman. That's probably one reason. And he won't force himself upon anybody. But he always awaits an invitation. Some of you are out there, and God wants to give you a heart-burning experience. He wants to give you a heart-filling experience. He wants to, he wants to uh, heal your heart that is broken. But you're going to have to invite him in to your situation. And God gave the world perhaps the greatest but most perilous gift he could give, and that is free will agency, the ability to choose. In other words, if you don't invite Jesus in, he could pass on by. That is a tough reality. In fact, Jesus in the book of Revelation says, those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. This is Revelation 3, 19 and 20. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I'll eat with him and he with me. I saw a famous painting years ago and it was Jesus standing at the door knocking and the door had no handle. And it's because of this principle of invitation. The handle's on the inside. Jesus will wait for you to invite him in because he will not impose his will on your free will. In fact, in this story, Jesus acted as if he was going to go. I think that's a test. And the cool, cool news is they passed it. They, 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 they implored him, please come. They urged him strongly, the Bible says. And when we do, look what he does. Jesus cannot ignore that kind of hunger, that kind of uh, invitation. He cannot resist, and so he stayed with them. So this is what I want you to do in your homes, wherever you are. Maybe you're in a group together. I want you to get the elements. If you haven't already been instructed to do that earlier, get some elements. I want you to get some bread. I've got a whole loaf here. And I want you to get some juice. This is not a Cabernet, so don't get nervous about your pastor. Okay? And I want you to join me in communion. You go ahead and do it. Get it. Get it ready. And uh, I want to lead you in communion in just a couple of minutes. And so I'm just setting you guys up right now. But in this story, and I put it in our story, their hearts have been won over now. They get a basic meal together, some bread and some wine. And it's at this point, this intersection, where this, this, there's this great moment that takes place where Jesus reveals himself to him. How, how does he do it again? He took some bread, he broke it, and... And the Bible says he gave thanks and, and, and he prayed. I believe there was wine there too, but it just doesn't say it in this particular rendering. He gives the bread to them. And after they take it, bam, 
they recognize him. It was in that action um, that they'd seen before. They'd heard about before. They'd heard about the, the, the night before, you know, he, um, he was crucified. They, they'd, they'd heard the stories maybe about the feeding of the 5,000. But I think it was different this time because as he's breaking bread, they're seeing his hands, his nail-pierced hands. And they're, and they're, all of a sudden it's different. They become aware. Uh, this is the risen Christ. And in that instant, they knew him. And in that instant, he disappears. <laughs> and I think it's because, again, God wants us to put our trust not in his bodily presence, but he wants us to put our trust in our worship of him, our following of his commands, but also in remembering what he did for us on Calvary 2,000 years ago, and that he also was risen from the grave. This was a moment where the presence of the Lord was so strong, they, their hearts were burning inside of them. They were on fire for God right now. And I'm going to show you in the final kind of challenge of this message that they were on fire for God. When you allow the word to get in you, when you invite the very presence of Jesus into this experience, you'll come alive. You'll be on fire. And so I want to lead you right now. I would like you to just take the bread and take your cup. We'll do this quickly. And I want you to just take uh, the body. This symbolizes the body of Jesus Christ. It's, it symbolizes uh, life. It symbolizes healing. I want you to take it right now and eat you all of it quickly. In the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for healing. Thank you that your body was broken for me. so much, Lord. Whoever's sick among you, I pray you're healed even as you take the body of Jesus Christ. Then I want you to take the cup. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. The blood of Jesus gives us access to God, but it also gives us authority over our enemy. It protects us. It provides protection for us as well. And the angel of death passed over. Whatever passes over you, because the blood is on the doorposts of your life. But I want you to just take this blood. I want you to be thankful for it. Receive right now what Jesus did for you for the forgiveness of sins, his shed blood. Drink you all of it quickly in the name of the Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Where, where are you? If you're listening, maybe you didn't take communion, maybe you did. Where are you on the road to Emmaus? Where are you on your journey of faith right now? Are you in a heartbreaking place? Do you know Jesus died and his blood was shed so your broken heart could be put back together again? There's a hole in your heart. There's broken pieces that only God can put back together again. And so I'm going to give you a chance right now to actually let him mend you, put you back together, make you new, whatever was whatever that part of you don't like, that, that old life. He wants to give you a new life in Him. That's all possible. Uh, you, you don't even have to you know, understand it all. You have to take a step of faith. The Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith. And if you want that, I want to pray for you. This has been one of the most important decisions you've ever made in your life. You can start your road to Emmaus. You can start your spiritual journey today. And so right wherever you are, um, I want you to pray with me. And close your eyes, not because it makes you spiritual, but it just helps you focus. Just say this. Say, Jesus, Jesus, come on, say that. Today, I give you my life. Today, I put my trust in you. I transfer trust from me to you. I receive what you did for me on the cross. Save me. Make me a new person. In Christ Jesus, amen. Listen, that seems so simple, doesn't it? It's hard to live out, but it's that simple to receive. I want to encourage you, if you've made that decision, tell somebody. Raise your hand right there in chat. I just made a decision to receive Jesus. I also want to strongly encourage you. At our church, we would say, it's recommendatory. Make sure that you tell somebody. Would you text us? 
Let us know that you just made that decision. Or, the, or if not, or in addition, pray with somebody in the chat room, in the side. Just let them know, uh, this is a decision I made. And maybe you have prayer, a prayer need. They want to pray for you. But if you'll text us to CC Saved at 97,000, guess what? I'm going to send you a road map for your spiritual journey. Your road to Emmaus, I've got a road map for you, and I want to send that to you right now. Now listen, for the rest of you, I hope that you've had a heart-filling experience through this message because the Word has come alive to you. But I'm also praying that through communion, you've had a heart-burning experience where even while we were taking communion, you were sensing and experiencing the presence of God. You don't have to just do that when we do it at church. The Bible says not necessarily to do it often, but as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And I hope you do it with a new mindset. I hope you do it with a new hunger because God wants to reveal himself. He wants you to be able to recognize him. And you can recognize him through his living word and you can recognize the bread of life and also through the breaking of bread together. Do it with your spouse. Do it with your family. Do it in your small group. Do it more and God will reveal himself more. Now my final encouragement is this. Verse 33 in the story says, Right after that happened, Jesus disappears. They're having communion. Boom, he's out of there. It says they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. They found the disciples there assembled and they said, Hey guys, it's true. It's true. Everything that they're talking about, the little buzz, the little rumors, it's true. Then they told, the two told, what had happened along the way, along the road to Emmaus, and how Jesus was recognized when he broke bread. This is so powerful. So even in the middle of the night, even when he disappeared, even uh, when uh, all these rumors are going on, guess what? They, they believe because they recognize Jesus through the same experience you just had. And they couldn't help talking about what they had seen and heard and experienced. Let me tell you something for my final thought as you go away. Real Christianity is whatever you receive you give away. I want to encourage you to go and tell somebody what you received today. That's a sign that you got the real deal. I love you. It's been a privilege to preach to you today. I hope to see you at one of our locations in the coming week or coming weeks and uh, be at a small group. Maybe I'll see you there on one of our leadership meetings. It's an honor to pastor you guys. Have a great, great Sunday. God bless you.